and turn with me to uh, Exodus, the third chapter. And I want to read the first through the six verses. Exodus, the third chapter, the first through the sixth verses. And here we find the words. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Scripture as it is written. May the Lord bless us in the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and each other. Would you, as you settle into your seats, take the hand of someone within arm's reach and say to them, Friend, you ain't grown till you make peace with your parents' sins. I pondered and was greatly torn about whether entitled this sins of the fathers. For there are those compelling words in the Decalogue in later and later on in the book of Exodus which says the sins of the fathers are transferred to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, saith the Lord. But that would have been too patrifocal and would not have allowed psychological room for women, mothers and daughters to find themselves in the sermonic story. So therefore we use more egalitarian language, making peace with your parents and your elders. Now last week, in the first installment of this series, uh, the gospel comes to Wakanda, taking advantage of the popularity, even yea, the obsession of um, folks with this new movie that is setting records box office records and and while I'm at it let me say to folks particularly my folk um, <laughs> stop calling travel agents and asking them what it costs to book a flight to Wakanda <laughs> it's embarrassing it's not real stop it embarrassing <laughs> but taking advantage of the popularity of it to say some things I want to address anyway and using it as a porthole into themes that resonate with Lent which is a time of introspection um, last week I said that every great movie is known in part for great lines, like in A Few Good Men, where you have that seminal scene where a gnarly, defiant colonel, played by Jack Nicholson, is on the witness stand and says to a young and flippant 
military lawyer played by Tom Cruise, you can't handle the truth. Well, today, I want to take another step and say great movies are known in part for their great subplots. Subplots are narratives that spin off from the main storyline that flesh out the various characters and supporting cast in the movie and in so doing provide the movie depth and multi-dimension and allow the audience through the narratives of these various subplots to find themselves in the story because no story can help you until you can see yourself in the story now, everybody knows the main storyline in Black Panther is about the fictitious <laughs> African nation touch your neighbor and say it's fictitious it's fictitious desirable but yet fictitious fictitious nation of Wakanda that is is blessed to be the custodian of this near magical material called vibranium that they receive via a meteorite that plunged into earth in times of antiquity buried itself in the mountains of Wakanda and gave the Wakandan people a technological advance over all other societies in the world. They are sheltered off from the rest of the world by impenetrable rainforests and appear to the outside world to be nothing but another poor third world African nation of shepherds and farmers but unbeknown to the world behind the impenetrable forces there's the most advanced and sophisticated society known yet to humanity because of the byproducts of this vibranium which allows them technological advances unsurpassed anywhere else and medical advances unsurpassed anywhere else and allows them to create enhancements of body and mind that border at times on the supernatural including the heart-shaped herb which was given exclusively to the kings, the successive kings of Wakanda which gave them mental and physical and intellectual enhancements that collectively are referred to as the powers of the Black Panther. And, that, and, and there is pressure building now, internally and externally, both noble and nefarious forces, for Wakanda to share its great wealth, its great power and technology with the rest of a world fraught with famine and disease and war and oppression so that people in general and black people in particular who are pressed all over the world might have a means by which to rise for Wakanda to be concerned about more than just Wakanda to move from being xenophobic and parochial and internal and isolationist to being global that's the main story Spinning off from that are many meaningful subplots that allow us to vicariously get transported, conscripted into the story as it dovetails with our own personal narratives. One of the most compelling subplots is the relationship between the main character, the current king of Wakanda, the current Black Panther, T'Challa, and the unexpectedly, unexpectedly complicated relationship with his father, the previous king, T'Chaka, as it evolves in the movie. Um, there are two times in the movie when T'Challa is given the serum that comes from the heart-shaped flower that gives him the powers of the Black Panther. One, in the first instance, when he ascends to the throne after his father T'Chaka's death. And as he receives the herb, he's buried in the burning sands, and it takes him psychologically to a mystical place where he returns to the place of his elders. And he has 
a conversation, a charmed conversation with his father whom he concedes, I am not ready, or as he says, I am not ready. <laughs> I can speak Wakandanese. <laughs> I am not ready to reign without you. In response to which T'Chaka says, what father would not prepare his children to go on without them? But in the second instance, when he receives the serum from the heart-shaped flower, it is after his near-death experience, when his throne has been usurped by Njadaka, who otherwise goes by Eric Kilgore. Who is the killmonger, who is the angry, his angry cousin, nephew of the king T'Chaka, who defeated him in hand to hand combat, threw him over a ledge, thinking he was dead, left him for dead. But in the providence of God, his body washed up along some river. He is taken by some fishermen to. Uh, Mbaku, who is the king of the Jabari tribe that lives in the hill country. And after the throne is usurped by Killmonger, who then tries to burn up all of the heart-shaped flowers so that no future king will have access to the powers of the Black Panther, only him and him alone. And it is uh, Nakia, he is the love of his life, who has the presence of mind to grab one of the heart-shaped flowers and then grab his mother, Ramonda, and they run up to Mbaku up in the hill country with the intention to give the heart-shaped flower to him because maybe he then would have a fighting chance against Killmonger. But Ramonda does not trust him, tells Nakia she should drink it, but then she says, I have no army to command, so then she just keeps it. But as they go to him, then he leads them to a place where they find out that in fact, T'Challa is not dead. He is barely clinging to life in a bed of ice. Don't you see the resurrection themes there? In the Bible, it tells us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, the woman closest to Jesus, after his crucifixion, they scurry to the tomb on Sunday morning, only to find out he is not dead, he is risen. And now we see the mother of T'Challa and the woman closest to T'Challa, they're scurrying only to find out he is not dead. Don't you see that in all cultures, your folklore and movies are folklore that spin off from your dominant religion. Resurrection themes all through this. She gives him the, heart, the serum that comes from the heart-shaped flower. They bury him in ice. It takes him once again to the place of his elders. And once again, he has a second conversation with his father. But this time he knows his father's secret. He knows of how his father killed his uncle decades earlier killed him when his uncle tried to kill another Wakandan who was a spy to keep an eye on his uncle who was in collusion <laughs> with, you, with you, you, Ulysses Claw to try and get the vibranium and use it for nefarious purposes. And then in an effort to stop his brother uh, T'Challa's uncle from killing his, his fellow countrymen, which was the right thing to do, to cover it all up so that he would not have to tell his countrymen about the treason of, the, of his brother and, and, and that he had to kill his brother to stop him from murdering a fellow countryman. They left the boy there, left him without a mother, left him without a father to fend for himself on the mean streets of Oakland. And in doing so, they created a monster because he fed off his anger of abandonment, not understanding fully why his father died. And he would take on the name Eric Killmonger and his father's secret sin that he wanted no one to know. And you know, if you remember nothing else about the sermon, remember this. Secrets have a way of not staying secret. And the secret did not stay secret because that secret grew up and that secret got angry and that secret came and almost killed 
T'Challa in hand-to-hand combat. And that secret usurped the throne. And that secret was destroying everything about Wakanda and its institutions. And that secret was trying to destroy the future for all Wakandan kings. That secret almost destroyed everything that nation was or ever could be. And so in that second meeting, T'Challa, the new Black Panther says to T'Chaka, the old Black Panther, he's, who's trying to explain to him why he did what he did, and after hearing his answer, he still retorts to his father, but you were wrong! And he was right. He was wrong. He meant well. But he was wrong. And the question becomes, for every child that grows up, every boy that becomes a man, every girl that becomes a woman, every generation of children that becomes the new young adults, what do you do when you reach that place where you have come into the knowledge, come into the awareness, come face to face with the shortcomings, the faults, the warts, the secrets, the sins? of your parents, of your elders. What do you do when those who heretofore were larger than life to you, they were your first intimations of God. You thought of them with the purest of motives, the flawless of record. And now the sober-eyed viewpoint of an adult because you may be their child, but you're not a child. And now you realize, mama and daddy is less like God and more like you. What do you do when you're looking at them and you know they are wrong? Virginia Satir says, one is not grown until they have come face to face with the shortcomings and the sins of their elders and have processed them in some constructive way that allows them to go on and be what they're supposed to be. Making peace with your elders. Well, I contend that today as, 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 as we struggle to be all that we intend to be in making peace with your parents' shortcomings and flaws, the first thing you have to do is you have to make the connection. The connection between you and them. If you remember nothing else about this sermon, I know I said it already, but remember this too. You have to make the connection because in making the connection you see the depth of the indebtedness and, and, and it's, it's when you are aware of the depth of the indebtedness that you are psychologically returned to a place of respect and honor that is due despite the sin that you're looking at. Did you catch that? Let me say that again. It, it's, it's when you make the connection between you and them that you become aware of the depth of the indebtedness you have to them, which psychologically returns you to a place of respect and honor that is due despite the real or perceived flaws that you are looking at. That, that's really the story behind the story of Moses' call here in Exodus 3 where it says, you hear the phrase that is replete throughout the Old Testament, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's, it's replete throughout the Old Testament. But this is the one time in the Old Testament record where we see that phrase where it is prefaced by another human designation. There are other times in scripture where the phrase is used where it is prefaced by God's designation, reference to himself, where he says, I am the Lord thy God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the household of bondage. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is a designation, a reference to himself. But this is the only time where the phrase, I am the Lord thy God, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, of Jacob, where it's prefaced by another human designation where he says to Moses, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, what does that matter, Pastor? Well, roll back with me to the second chapter. Keep the text in context so we're not functioning from a pretext. In the second chapter in Exodus, it opens up just one chapter back in your rearview mirror. It says that there was a man of the tribe of Levi who married a Levite woman, and they had a son. They saw that it was a goodly child. It says for three months she hid him. 
And Pharaoh at this time was killing all Jewish babies two years of age and under as using genocide as a strategy for population control. And it says that then after three months, when she could hide him no more, she put him in a basket, floated him down the bulrushes in the Nile River, had his sister stand afar off, uh, far enough to not be noticed, close enough to see what was going on, and watch that basket float into the bathing pools of the daughters of, of, of Pharaoh. And the daughter of Pharaoh picked it up, saw this beautiful little male child, and then the sister came, showed herself and said, would you like me to go get a, a Hebrew woman to be the wet nurse and nurse the child? And she said, yes. And she went and got his own mother, who then was hired, see how God works, to come and be the wet nurse and nurse her own child and was hired to raise her own child in Pharaoh's own house. And yet in all of that, you don't see Moses' father mentioned anywhere other than the fact that he married his mom and deposited some seed. When it comes to the protection of the child, the looking over of the child, the nursing of the child, the watching of the child, the making critical decisions of the child, his sister, his mama, Pharaoh's daughter, but daddy never came back. Why didn't daddy watch the basket down the river? Why didn't daddy negotiate the deal? Why didn't daddy try to be somehow another involved in it? We don't know. All we know that he is missing in action. So much so that when God calls Moses to be his black panther, and I'm not overstating it too much because the scripture also tells us that when Moses asked God for a sign, he says, stick your hand into your bosom and bring it out. And when he brought it out, it says his hand suddenly became white as leprosy. It was discolored. He said, he said, now stick it back in. He said, and when he brought it back out, it was his normal color. So if the abnormal color was white, then the normal color was. Oh, as Tupac said, you got me feeling like black was the thing to be. <laughs> I'm just saying what I'm saying. It's right there in the text. You just never saw it. When he's calling Moses to be his black panther, his deliverer, the one with superpowers, to deliver his people from the slave pits of Egypt to the threshold of the promised land, he has to go back and he's got to resolve this unresolved daddy issue. That Moses followed his military acumen and his scholastic achievement and his valor and all of his physical uh, endowments. He's got an unresolved daddy issue. And when God calls him and says, I'm not only the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but Moses, I want you to know I'm also the God of your father. The one who wasn't around. The one that you've been wondering why he never came back. The one you were wondering why he was never there when you had to run into exile because they saw you kill that man and you couldn't call him and say dad what should I do the one that you've been wondering all these years where was he because your ability to be effective as my deliverer depends on you making peace with your father's sin of just being absent and you need to make the connection Moses because though he was wrong you need to see the connection because when you see the connection then you see the depth of the indebtedness and once you see the depth of the indebtedness it brings you back to a place of respect and honor that is due despite the sin that is real or perceived in your mind because the reality is without them there ain't no you put, 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 that, put that first picture up there the one I sent you yeah that's that picture was taken in, in April of 1987 at my graduation, a reception at graduation from Colgate Rochester Divinity School. I was 25 years old, and uh, 30 years later, I'm only two years older. <laughs> I mean, some of us have a way of just collapsing time. <laughs> Don't look no different. Say amen. amen. I didn't say laugh, I said say amen. To my right is my grandmother, the late Neela Patterson, Nat's mother, my mama's mother, and to my left is my mother. To my left, your right. That's the same chin. Same smile, same eyes. The genetic stamp is undeniable. You can almost hear Paul saying to young Timothy, I can remember your, mom, your grandmama Eunice, your, mama, your mama Lois, and now I see that the same faith is in you. You make the connection, you see the indebtedness. And when you see the indebtedness, 
you, you're returned to a place of respect and honor even when you think they were wrong about something they did, about the way they raised you, what, what they, were they there or not there, did or did not do. You know, um, um, I understand yesterday at choir rehearsal, Deneen, you guys took prayer requests at the end of rehearsal and mama stood up to give a prayer request and then I understood after a few others she stood up a second time to make a prayer request and I understood she was making it so loquaciously you had to say, now Mother Nash. <laughs> Sometimes mama got to be hurried along in her story and then I understand some members walked out of rehearsal saying, now I know why Pastor hold us so long. <laughs> They made the connection. When you see the connection, you understand the depth of the indebtedness. And it turns you to a place of honor and respect due. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, Reverend Harris asked me when I struck into an old song. He said, where do you know all them old songs? I said, got it from my mama. There's an indebtedness. Without, without her, there, there is no me. And if I put a picture of my father up here, though he's never been around, never bought me a slice of bread. Never saw me score one touchdown. Never helped me work through one problem in school. But you would see if, but only in the deposit of a genetic seed, a genetic coding, you see the connection and, and, and all of the physical endowment that have blessed me through my life and intellectual acumen and, and, and abilities that, that, that I have had to work with despite his absence. There I see the connection which shows me the depth of the indebtedness even with him missing in action. That returns me to a place of honor and respect due, despite the sins of the flaws. Because the reality is, without them, there is no you. And sometimes it's not just in family, sometimes it's generations. The kids become adults and the generations get frustrated with the generations that came before them. And the Black Lives Matter generation has to see the connection between them and the Barack Obama generation. And the Barack, because without them, there is no you. And the Barack Obama generation has to see the connection between them and the Martin King generation because without them there is no us. And the Martin King generation has to see the, the connection between them and the Asa Philip Randolph uh, generation, who re the ones who really planned the march on Washington. Um, and Martin King was the keynote speaker only because they threw, drew lots, the 16 largest civil rights organizations. Martin King in the providence of God drew the 16th straw and was the keynote speaker. But he was not the one who planned the event. It was the Asa Philip Randolphs, who had been around decades before Martin King, anyone even knew his name. And without them, there was no him. But the Asa Philip Randolph generation had to understand its connection to the Marcus Garvey generation. They gave us Pan-Africanism and the Backer Africa movement, and who was stopped only by the government who brought them up on false tax dodging charges. Because when you can't destroy them by anything else, you destroy them by taxes. Come on, somebody. But the Marcus Garvey generation has to see its connection to the Booker T. Washington and the William Earhart Du Bois generation, who intellectually collided over the concepts of integrationism versus separatism. But the, the, but the Booker T. Washington and William Earhart Du Bois generation had to see their connection between the Henry McNeil Turner and the Frederick Douglass, who, by the way, tell Trump he'd been dead over 100 years. <laughs> And the Sojourner Truth and the Harriet Tubman generation, who were a generation of abolitionists who were fighting to be free, and though they were born in slavery, they could match which with people who graduated from our greatest universities. Because even though you ain't got degrees, it don't mean that you ain't got no sense. But the Henry McNeil Turners and the Frederick Douglass and the Sojourner Truth and the Harriet Tubman generation had to see their connection to generations of Kunta Kintes who, who, who had a memory of what it was like to be free and passed on that story even though they lived their lives in chains and may have even lost a foot or two along the way trying to get free. But the generations of Kunta Kintes had to make the connection between themselves and the Akhenatans and the Nefertitis and the Hannibals and the kings and queens of African antiquity who were the first people to crawl out of the caves and create cities and libraries and hospitals and who were doing cataract surgery a thousand years before uh, uh, Hippocrates, who's the father of Western medicine, was even born. You have to see the connection. When you see the connection, you understand the depth of the indebtedness. And once you see the depth of the indebtedness, you're taken to a place of respect and honor that is due even when you think they are wrong. Because without them, there is no you. And when you're running across what mom and daddy didn't do right, what this generation didn't do right, 
and God knows and when the secret is told and they are not right no one's saying they are right what they're saying is do you still see the connection yes. because once you understand the depth of the indebtedness there still remains the obligation for respect and honor that is due because without them there is no you but then secondly and paradoxically perhaps even ironically after you see the connection you have to see the distinction the distinction while it is true that without them there is no you it is also true that they are not you and you are not them without them there is no you but you are not them And indebtedness should never be confused with inevitability. To be indebted to someone and to recognize the depth to which you are indebted does not mean that you are inevitably to become as them. While there is no you without them, you still are not them. Uh, but put, put, put that second picture up on the, on the screen. This is the scene where T'Challa has learned of his father's secret and he's talking to the love of his life, Nakia, played by Lapita Nyong'o. The, the lovely Lapita <laughs> Nyong'o. I, I mean, when I hear the name, I feel like the hyenas in Lion King, when they heard Mufasa's name, they said, say it again, say it again. <laughs> Lapita, the younger. Come here, Pox, some say the blacker the bear, sweeter the juice, I say the darker the flesh, the head, the deeper. The... Oh, let me stay on point here, let me stay on, let me stay on point here. I'm just saying that th this Black Panther know he loves some blackberry. Can I get a witness? And, 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 and she, I knew I'd get a witness there and over there. I know where my help come from. And, she, and as he laments over his father's sins, she says to him, you will determine what kind of king you will be. Because while you see the connection, do you see the distinction? And that's where Elijah got himself in trouble in the Old Testament passage that I had you read today. This is a topical sermon, not a textual sermon where you stick with one text. It's a topical sermon that takes me to various texts that are touchstones in the story. And you see Elijah after he has had the, the incredible victory on the peaks of Mount Carmel when it was one prophet of, of Yahweh versus 300 and some odd prophets of Baal. Baal was believed to be the Canaanite god that controlled weather. The Baalites were worshipped by the pagan queen that Ahab, unequally yoked, married a heathen woman, a pagan, allowed her to build an altar to a pagan god right in the temple of God who says as his first decalogue, as the first law in the decalogue, thou shalt have no other gods before me and you build an altar to a pagan god right in my house. Ahab did more to anger God than any other king, ancient king of Israel because of that and he raised up Elijah who went to him as a special counsel. And he said to him that you brought a Baal worshiper into the household of God. Baal's supposed to be the God that controls weather. Well, God Yahweh is going to show you that there is only one God who rules the heavens and the earth. And if you think Baal controls weather, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to shut up, bottle up, close up the windows of heaven. Neither do nor rain as much as spit going to fall from the sky for three years until I say so. And let's see if Baal can snatch a teardrop from the clouds. He goes to Mount Carmel, he takes them on, and he says, Now let's see if the devotees of Baal versus the prophet uh, Elijah representing Yahweh, whose God can bring the jagged configurations of lightning that they, recall, recall, that they refer to as heavenly fire and strike the altar of God. After hours of hoodoo and voodoo and cutting their flesh, their tattooed up flesh that did, resulted in nothing, Elijah simply stepped up and said, Now, Lord, could you bring a little fire? 
and the sky became as night as noonday. The clouds welled up and the crack of lightning and the jagged configurations shot across the sky, bent at a 90 degree angle and exploded on the altar, wet with wood and he made wet wood burn. He said, Elijah's God brings the fire because Elijah's God is God because it doesn't matter how many folk are against you. If God is on your side, you're always in the majority. That's why we've always said, it's going to be all right. Why? Because me and God, always, God can do more for you than the whole world against you. Have I got two, three witnesses up in here? And Elijah, fresh off that victory strange how he was so he was so masculine he was so mighty he was so steadfast so unflinching in front of all of those men but one crazy woman Jezebel one crazy woman any brothers ever dated a crazy woman know what I'm talking about one crazy woman worst thing you ever want to happen to you one crazy woman and Elijah fled Elijah fled to the hill country and he finds himself up in the mountains saying I am no better than my fathers and he wants to die because the prophets of old had all capitulated under the pressure of the pagans to save their life they went along to get along and he said I am no better than my fathers he sees the connection but he thinks connection he, but he fails to make the distinction and he thinks indebtedness means inevitability. I ain't going to be no better than them. And that's when the Lord tells him, I got 7,000 prophets that ain't bowed knee to Baal. Every new generation represents a possible junction in the road. An opportunity for society to replenish itself. If my generation has become such fools that you can't make a common sense decision that military grade weapons don't belong in the hands of people in a non-military situation. Then the children have to rise up in the face of their parents' sins. Hmm? In the face of their parents' sins. See, see, one of the things that, that young people have to learn, and we all have to learn when we grow up and we become too aware of the, the warts and the foibles and the false steps of those who come before us is that dealing with your parents' stuff is like eating fish. You gotta learn to eat the meat and spit back the bones. Every generation of parents has the same goal. You're gonna be the first perfect parents. How many of y'all pledge you're gonna be the first perfect parent? You was going to correct everything foul in the family system. You was going to do everything right. Your children were going to go to their grave saying, my mom and daddy was the greatest. And it was going to be des a deserved accolade. And everyone failed. And don't nobody know it better than your children. We'll have to learn to accept mom and daddy for their strengths and what they did for them. But know what bones to leave on the plate. To know what will bless your family, to know what to keep out your family. There were in, in every generation in churches. There may have been generations in the past who took a, 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 a teenage girl when she got pregnant and drug her before a, and, and made her apologize to a congregation full of fornicators. Who did what she did or worse. They just didn't get pregnant or went and took care of it or moved the baby out of town. To where morality was defined by if you get caught. Now we want to say to that kind of mentality, that kind of hypocrisy, you are wrong. All we like sheep have gone astray. And their sin doesn't come in increments of small, medium, and large. 
And Jesus died as a propitiation for our sins. And propitiation not only means that he atones for our sin, he forgives our sins. Not only means he delivers us and breaks us from the bondage of our sin, but a propitiation, it means that he covers our sin. And if Jesus covers our sin, why would we be in the business of uncovering people's sins? You are wrong in the name of holiness. To uncover someone else's sins when your sins are as bad or worse. How many of us could withstand a public rollout of our deepest and darkest secrets? I am, thank you. Not only will we see the connection, we must see the distinction because we represent an opportunity. When you're looking at your parents' shortcomings, the elders' shortcomings, and they're wrong, real or perceived, don't you realize you are the opportunity to take the family in a different generation? Don't you see the call of Moses? Not only does he say, I am the, I am the God of your father, because you need to make the connection with the one that you want to deny. But then he comes back and says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, I am the God who has been the God of your people. That's shorthand for all the generations. I am the God that's working from generation to generation. Thou art God. And, 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 I, and I'm up to something. I'm doing a good work. But the work that I'm doing was, was not completed in one generation. So I, I was the God during the Abraham generation. I was the God, I kept on being God during the Isaac generation. I wasn't done with what I was doing in the Jacob generation. I wasn't done what I was doing when it got to the Joseph generation. I wasn't done when I got to the, to, to, to the Manasseh and Ephraim generation. I, I, I wasn't done when I got to all the generations that came after that. I, I, I wasn't done even when I got to Bethlehem's manger. When I found a savior because I wasn't done, I had to keep going up to an upper room and bring down some Holy Ghost fire. And I'm not done even to today because you are descendants of that, of the Petrine line. As I keep on going until he comes back, when he rolls back the clouds and the Lord shall descend. I come to tell you that God is not through with us yet. And every generation is an opportunity to take the family in another, make the family in the church better, higher, broader. So it means that we not only need to make the connection, we need to make the distinction, and ultimately we may need to make the decision. I didn't say a decision, I said the decision. That's right. There's a difference between a decision and the decision. The decision is one that really matters. There's a difference between an issue and the issue. You've got many issues in your life, but then there's the issue that's determining whether or not their life goes in green pastures or in desert and famine places. You got many problems, but then there is the problem that's got your life hung up somewhere. You got many hurts, but then there is the hurt, the one that's made you think about taking yourself out of here or taking somebody else out of here. And so when I talk about when I talk about the decision, there's there's many decisions, but the decision and the decision, the decision is is is, is the one that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians the 13th chapter in that 5th verse of all the descriptions he gives of love he says love keeps no record of wrong ultimately love decides to let it go love is not boastful love is not proud love does not seek his own love is not arrogant but ultimately love keeps no record of wrong I heard Manuel Scott Sr., the diminutive sized preacher for Los Angeles, went to Dallas, one of the great African American pulpiteers. He said, When people deal with the woman who was caught in adultery, and they talk about the Lord, how he knelt and wrote in the sand. He says, For two millennia now, we've been debating and arguing, what did Jesus write in the sand? And he said, Perhaps the interrogative is misaimed. Perhaps it was never a question about what he wrote in the sand. But that he wrote in sand. He says because he could have asked for a pen and paper and wrote in ink so that what he wrote would have been preserved for posterity. But he said I think he wrote in the sand because whatever he wrote he wanted it to be erased. Because the God who describes love as keeping no record of wrong. There are some things 
that God wants to erase. Because he doesn't want them indelibly imprinted upon the psyche and the band, brand of the family. He wants them to be erased by a generation who have discovered a letting go grace. Not a denial grace, denying that it ever happened. That in itself is a form of psychosis. But one who had like the Sankofa bird who goes back through processes and comes out to where after seeing the connection and making the distinction, they make a conscious decision to love despite, to love regardless of, to love in the face of, because if you can't love despite what you know, if you can't love regardless of what has happened, if you can't love in the face of what went down, then what you don't have is love. You may have infatuation, you may have like, because love is never to be a reward for good behavior. Love is to be something you can rely on when you are at your worst. I've told my children more than a few times, Sheila and I have told them in growing up, when they messed up at this or messed up in that, as children will do, we said, no matter what you do, there's nothing you will ever be, a, there's nothing you will ever do that will make us stop loving you because we don't love you as a reward for good behavior. We love you when you're at your worst and we love you for one reason and one reason only and that's because you are ours. And as long as you are ours, if you are on death row for murder, I'm still gonna love you because you are mine and if there's any other reason for it it ain't love you passing it off as love if I got to earn it if I got to make a payment on it if there's a tax on it it ain't love it's emotional manipulation and psychological abuse if you can't know my worst and still love me anyway you never love me at all love is unconditional have I got a witness have I got a witness and that's why part of being an adult is when you grow up and you see the warts and the foibles and then you have to do what they first did to you. You got to decide if you're going to love folks the way they loved you. Because the only reason why somebody put a roof over your head and worked a second job so you could go to college and came up to the school to see about you when you got kicked out or prayed for you while you were asleep is because they loved you no matter what and now you got to decide can you love back in the same way because if you if they got to be perfect for you to love them it's something else it ain't love even Jesus being polite had his moment he thought his father didn't do right by him. The same Jesus who heard his father say on his baptism, Behold my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The same Jesus who they found in the temple that day when his mama tried to berate him because he wasn't where she thought he was supposed to be. He said, Woman, I got to be about my father's business. The same Jesus that told his disciples, When you see me, you see my father. I am my father are one. All but one Friday afternoon, for about three hours, when his father turned his back on him, when the nails were in his hand and the spikes were in his feet and they gouged a, a crown of thorns in his brow, when they were gambling for his thought lot and some were saying, if you be the Christ, come down from the cross. Amidst the excruciating pain of the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, which meant my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And sometimes when you're going through crucifixion, hell and high water, it feels like your mother, your father has forsaken you. Oh, but if you come back Sunday morning, you find out that the same daddy you thought forsook you because of that cross, he reached down from heaven and by the power of God, he has raised you up. Because the father never forsakes you. Have I got a witness? Have I got a witness? What's love got to do with it? Love woke me up this morning. Love started me on my way. Love gave me a new way of walking and a new way of talking. Love gave me joy bells after the storm. Love not only lifted me, love allows me to see the worst and still believe the best. Love allows me to step into the muck and still believe in the joy. Love allows me to reach down when you're broken and help you become whole. Love allows you to see that I can't expect no more of you than I can expect of myself. Love allows me to see that it ain't love until you show what you can do in the face of the sin even when I'm wrong do you love me
Because the question is, are you going to be the king that God wants you to be? Are you going to be the teacher God wants you to be? Are you going to be the preacher God wants you to be? Are you going to be the parent God wants you to be? Because the biggest thing threatening it is the fact that you ain't made peace yet with your parents' sins. And don't miss the point. T'Challa had to make peace with the sins of a father who was already dead. Some of y'all in here today are struggling with your own children, in your own marriage, in your own ministry, because of stuff you haven't resolved with people who are already dead. And you don't have access to a heart-shaped flower, but the Holy Ghost can take you to the place of the elders. Some of y'all still need to let daddy go and mama go so that you can go on and be a deliverer, a king, or maybe just a good mother if your head bowed. Oh, God of our weary ears and God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far along the way, Thou who is by Thy might led us into the light, Lord, keep us forever in the path, we pray. Right now, God, I feel You kicking stones out the road. I feel the intensity of people who are being catapulted into a mystical place. They can see the faces of those who have gone on before. But there were secrets and issues unresolved. There were conversations that were never had. There were things said that were never taken back. There were questions that were never answered that have been haunting. God, I pray that you take all of us where we need to be. Deal with whatever we need to. Not deny, but take the St. Kofa journey back through. To not look in childish eyes of naivete. Needing to believe that everything's perfect to be okay. But to be able to stand in the midst of the muck, the mire, and the reality of life and still affirm that God is good and to see the connections and the indebtedness with people who weren't perfect but yet were still indebted and to be able to draw healthy lines about how we can do better and then to choose to love them despite regardless in the face of just as we have needed them to do us to love us despite regardless in the face of bring a healing in the family from generation to generation thou art God there is a bomb in Gilead that can make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead that can heal the sin sick soul. There is no sin his blood cannot cover. There is no hurt his grace cannot heal. There's no situation he cannot correct if we would just bring it to him, give it to him, trust him with him. And let God have God's way. Come Holy Spirit, come into the places that we have tightly guarded to our own peril. Come Holy Spirit, come. Open the closets, open the windows, open the doors.
pull open the blinds and let your light into those darkened places. Let fresh winds blow. Let a healing begin. That we can be all that you have called us to be. This is my prayer, God. I ask it in Jesus' name. Let every believer say amen. I dare you to touch two people right now and say, that one was just for me. Doors of the church are open. I offer you Jesus because even while that was a pastoral sermon and not an evangelistic sermon, I still offer you Jesus. That's what we offer you because Jesus is the answer.